welcome to yet another edition of Behind the Lens. It, if you're listening to us live, that means it's Monday. But you can hear hear and read. You can, uh, it's also a Monday of the week of a holiday. So I'm not talking well today. Um, no, I'm Debbie Elias, film critic, creator, and host of Behind the Lens. And you can find me here every Monday, 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m., Eastern Time. And for rebroadcasts of this show, if you miss us live, you can find us on iTunes at BehindTheLensOnline.net at IndiePopcorn.fm and several other places. Videos of the show are on YouTube. And when Big Boss is around, he's been guinea pigging and playing with doing Facebook Lives. So Pam and I are not doing that today. But (laughs) so... So sometimes you get that added bonus as well. But you can find my movie reviews and interviews, uh, audio, as well as in print format, in print and online, around the world, in the U.S. and abroad. But very excited for today's show. We have a returning guest with us today. Kelly Smoot Garrett is here. Uh, She'll be calling in shortly. Of course, Kelly, as usual, um already called. She's calling back because she's so anxious to talk to everybody about the fabulous Princess April Morning Glory book by Letitia Fairbanks. Uh, Our regular listeners know we've talked about this book before. Letitia Fairbanks, the niece of Douglas Fairbanks. And this book, it's an, the history of it is incredible. Uh, Kelly is Letitia's stepdaughter and her executor uh, since her passing. So she has now been spearheading the publication of the book and other ventures. And apparently some, she's got some surprise announcements about the Fairbanks family history and a potential other book that's coming out. So we're going to have Kelly on momentarily uh, in about 10 minutes to talk about Princess April Morning Glory and the Fairbanks legacy. At the half hour mark, okay, I admit it. This is not an Academy Award winning film. But it is so much fun. I can't recommend it highly enough. Attack of the Killer Donuts. Need I say more, people? Attack of the Killer Donuts is written by uh, Nathan Dalton, Chris DeChristopher, and Rafael Diaz-Wagner. Scott Wheeler, director, with an extensive VFX background, uh, is going to be joining us at the half-hour mark, along with... Raphael Diaz Wagner. Raphael is also a producer on the film. So I can't wait to talk to these two guys because this film had me laughing from beginning to end. The visual effects at creating killer donuts. Let your imaginations run wild for a minute at that image, people. Uh, it's all that and more, trust me. But before we get to all of that, got to do some clips, some exclusive interview clips. Uh, on Coco. Coco is coming out this Wednesday in time for the Thanksgiving holiday. It is from Disney Pixar. It is without a doubt, hands down, the best animated film of the year. And for my money, it should also be a contender for best picture with that up to 10 uh, best film uh, nomination system that's in play. It is the best thing that Pixar has ever done. I am in love with this film. And yes, that is on all those TV spots. That's us behind the lens. So, for which tickles me to no end that Disney uh, and Pixar were kind enough to use my pull quotes on a lot of their promotion for Coco. Because this is a film that I, I don't think I've loved something out of Pixar this much since The Good Dinosaur. Irrespective of the fact that Sam Elliott was voicing the T-Rex. Um, Coco is amazing. It is a fabulous story about family and it explores the wonderful Mexican heritage and culture with the land of the dead and the land of the living. Um, There is so much research, so much authenticity put into this, but it is an eye-popping visual splendor. I had a chance to sit down and talk with Lee Unkrich, the director, Darla Anderson, the producer, and Adrian Molina, one of the writers. And one of the first things we talked about If you got the land of the dead, you're going to have skeletons. 
But as most cinephiles and Disney aficionados know, skeletons play a very key part in the history of film and in the history of Disney. Because when you go all the way back to the very early Silly Symphonies back in the 30s, the skeleton dance was one of the signature animated films to come, animated sequences to be developed and to come out. And it has become an integral part of Disney lore and legacy. So, of course, we're going to talk about skeletons, but, and I just screwed up my whole order here, before that, we're going to talk about the music. Uh, soundtrack has been out. The soundtrack is a wonderful blend of Michael Giacchino's score and a lot of cultural music from Mexico. But, of course... We have Kristen Anderson Lopez and Robert Lopez, the forces behind the infamous Let It Go. Uh, they really let it go with this new song, Remember Me, which I believe will end up at possibly walking away with the Oscar for Best Original Song at the Oscars. But I took my advantage of the chance to talk to Lee and Darlin Adrian about the music. Well, I, I have to ask, you mentioned sound. I have to then ask about the sound, the score, and the original songs were written for this. The sound is so key. You have distinctive ele- distinctive sonic elements with bone, with ground, with cobblestone, and then different ethereal sounds within the Land of the Dead punctuated with your quote-unquote needle drop soundtrack and Michael's score. Mm-hmm. How did you mix all of those elements together? Gosh, I don't know. I mean, it's a long evolving process. Um, you know, we knew from the very from very early on with this particular story that we wanted music to be part of the fabric of the story that we were telling. We knew we were telling the story of a of an aspiring musician and who idolized other musicians who we were going to meet in the course of the storytelling. So we knew we had the opportunity for performance of music kind of throughout. Um, but we also wanted to really embrace needle drop, as you say, uh, you know, more traditional Mexican music existing songs and, and mix them up with the original songs that we wrote. Um, and then we also decided pretty early on to work with Michael Giacchino. Um, I, you know, he's done a bunch of our films at Pixar. He's very reliable uh, from an emotional standpoint. Like he, he's able to kind of help us realize what we're trying to make the audience feel in a really lovely way. And, um, and he was excited to work on this film because he's always been a fan of Mexican music, and he, but he had never had the opportunity in his career to write anything um, uh, himself in that vein. So we teamed him up with a, a great woman named Germaine Franco, who uh, helped us out quite a bit. She's a Mexican-American composer, and she helped uh, uh, Michael with a lot of his orchestration and arranging of music. Um, and we, we just we worked with a bunch of cultural consultants, different folks like Camila Lara, who uh, helped teach us about the, the broad landscape of Mexican music. And, and then it, it was just really, a, we didn't have it all figured out from the beginning. It was an evolving process of finding places, finding opportunities where we could have music, and, um, and then even finding opportunities to have music just be in the background and be part of the fabric mm-hmm. of the story that we were telling. Um, I looked to the Coen Brothers film, O Brother, Where Art Thou? To, in my mind, it was, a great, it was a great model of a film that was completely infused with music, and, and you can't separate the music from that movie. It's just part of the storytelling. And it was also about a very specific genre, in that case, of course, being Americana. And um, I wanted to do the same kind of thing with Coco and, uh, and just have a film that was as infused with uh, this beautiful, specific music. Of course, One of the first things Jermaine did was the castle... The Disney logo, the Disney Disney logo logo. castle. (laughs) So, and that was was the first one of the first things we worked with her on in this film. So, and of course, then you bring in Kristen and Robert for yes, what I hope will pick up the Oscar for best original song (laughs) because it's been stuck in my head since I heard it weeks ago. I mean, it's it's a fabulous song. Yeah, they did that very early on. We reached out to them. We had this notion of there being a song in the movie. We didn't know what it was called that there would be a song that could take on different meanings and different feelings throughout the story depending on how it was performed. And um, and we gave that assignment to Bobby and Kristen, and uh, they came back with Remember Me. Um, and even though a lot of our story changed over time from that point, that, that song has remained a constant throughout. It's always remained a part of the, the kind of emotional bedrock of the movie. And Remember Me is indeed 
an emotional bedrock and cornerstone of Coco. Because obviously, when you go to the land of the dead, you really hope that somebody will remember you. Uh, on that note, we're going to switch gears. We'll come back to Coco and skeletons later in the show. But right now, we've got... Kelly Smoot Garrett is with us. Hello. Hi there, Debbie. How you doing? I am fine. How are you doing? Doing great. Are you back in the United States yet or still on your whirlwind European tour? No, I'm back. I'm back. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, so am I. <laughs> I mean, I, I kept looking at all the fabulous pictures of the places that you were seeing overseas, and it just looks like you had an amazing time. It, w it was great. It was really wonderful. So, now, did you get to enlighten anyone in Europe about the wonder that is Princess April Morning Glory? Well, yes, I did. I got to meet with Dominic Fairbanks, oh. who is Douglas Fairbanks Sr.'s great-grandson. Oh, my goodness. And we are plotting and discussing what's coming up next for the Fairbanks family. Well, you're always plotting. So <laughs> <laughs> so anything out of your conversations with Dominic that you can reveal? Well, just that we are going to be uh, definitely working on honoring and promoting the 100th anniversary of the founding of United Artists by mm -hmm. Uncle Douglas and Aunt Mary. Mm -hmm. That's coming up uh, rapidly. Well, of course, Charlie Chaplin and D.W. Griffith. And that is coming up uh, really just around the corner in terms of, of publicity and promotion because the 100th anniversary will be February 5th, uh, 2019. So just one year from this upcoming February mm -hmm. 5th. So we're planning a slew of events leading up to that to remind everybody of the incredible contributions United Artists has made through Douglas Fairbanks, Mary Pickford, Charlie, and D.W. Well, and yeah, it's like we would not have film as it is today without these exactly. four individuals. Um, there may have been some iteration of of filmmaking, but it would definitely, this was one of the cornerstones, along with what Thomas Ince and Goldwyn and Mayer did. You know, all of these pioneers set the tone, mm -hmm. set the bar, and set filmmaking on its path. Right, absolutely. And, and to honor that, we're going to republish Letitia Fairbanks's, my stepmother's, uh, biography of her uncle. The it was originally published in 1953 by Henry Holt and Company, and uh, we are bringing it back because it is the definitive family bio biography of Douglas Fairbanks. Mm -hmm. And we're going to augment it with all sorts of never-before-seen family photographs mm -hmm. and uh, memorabilia and letters and correspondence that haven't been revealed before. Wow. Wow. Classic. And that is, that is Letitia's most public contribution to date to the family history, and she was noted by everyone, uh, especially her cousin, Douglas Fairbanks Jr., when he wrote um, The Salad Days, mm -hmm. uh, that... Uh, Letitia was the family historian. That was a role she held all her life. Mm -hmm. And she was primarily dedicated to preserving the memory of her uncle in the way that her uncle really wanted it to be preserved, mm -hmm. with the family uh, photos and the family memories that that, uh, that a lot of times the public nowadays has, is just, he's so dropped from view in so many respects. Uh, that that I think if the family under if the public knew what the family knows about him, they'd understand just what a dynamic force of nature he was. Mm -hmm. Well, and you know, classic film fans will be rabid over anything new to come to light about Douglas Fairbanks. 
Well, we hope so. We, we <laughs> hope so. And, and we think it will also play nicely into, again, continuing to introduce the public to the lovely fairy tale, Princess April Morning Glory, that well, Letitia wrote 10 years before she did this biography. Well, and of course, as we've mentioned before, you know, her uncle is a very important part of the fairy tale of Princess April Morning Glory. Yes. No, there would never be a prince chivalry without Douglas Fairbanks to, to show the way. I mean, to this day, if I were going to, uh, to write a book or illustrate a book, uh, a fairy tale with a prince, a prince chivalry or prince charming, my first thought would go to Douglas Fairbanks. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And and she she used she used her cousin Douglas Fairbanks Jr. as the model since since senior had already passed by that time, mm-hmm. but uh, it it definitely speaks to the ethos of, of the Fairbanks family in all respects, mm-hmm. most especially the main message of the book, which is doing good deeds for other people. Well, and that was a big message of Douglas Fairbanks. Absolutely, that was one of no, his was... mantras. Absolutely. You know, for those that, that haven't listened before and aren't familiar with the story, with Letitia's story, Princess April Morning Glory, you want to give a little backstory of a synopsis of what this enchanting fairy tale <laughs> is about? Sure, sure. Letitia began the story, uh, actually writing and creating the story, the night her, her uncle died, uh, which was... December 12th, uh, 1939. And she had conceived of the story as a fairy princess, Princess April Morning Glory, who, uh, like all protagonists, wants to grow and expand. Uh, and, and so she leaves the Magic Kingdom, and, and she gets out and she wants to see the great world. Well, once out, she realizes she can't get back in until she does, until a wise wizard tells her that the way to get back in is to do three good deeds. And so the book is her story of the three good deeds she does, as well as saving the world from the wicked fairy misery, and then her return to fairyland, where she spends her life and establishes a career doing three good deeds for deserving boys and girls around the globe. And, of course, those deeds are done every day. Yes, and it's it's the small deeds, not so much the big things that make the difference in one's life and show the true character of how people live. And mm-hmm. this, this was very important to the Fairbanks family, and it was something I was brought up with innately that we must all leave the world a better place than we found it Mm -hmm. and it's in those small daily things that you do for one another that really make the difference because Mm -hmm. the small deeds add up to the big ones well you know and what i what i so love about you know everybody can buy can get the the book now we'll talk about that in a second but you know this weekend you know wonder just came out in theaters and Mm. the whole movement behind wonder um which is it's you know bring five boxes of tissues with you when you see it the whole message is be kind be kind yes so you know this is a theme that pops up you know at times when we most need it you know douglas fairbanks and his whole idea of of do good deeds it was all during the post World War One, World War Two era, where mm-hmm. and then the Depression, where we really needed needed to be reminded of doing good deeds, helping others, and being kind. You know, I think it goes without saying in today's world to have a film where its message is be kind. Uh, nothing could be more timely. These things have a way of working their way into the zeitgeist, into our lives at points when we most need them. Yes, absolutely. And, and, and this, is, this is what uh, Douglas not only lived, but Douglas and Mary Pickford both portrayed in their screen roles. If mm-hmm. you 
look back, of course, it was the beginning of cinema, so they had complete choice as to what to portray. And they never portrayed bad people, because right. who would want to do that? Uh, you will always want to show the best of yourself and your best to the world. You wouldn't want to show the world what horrible things could be done. You wanted to show them what good could be done. Mm-hmm. Because real life was and, showing us already the horrible things that could be done. Right. That's world's full of that. So, so let's show the goodness in people and let's bring that out. Because they were very conscious, especially in those early years of film, that what they chose to portray would be echoed mm-hmm. and would be done and, and, and used as a role model again and again. So it was very important to them to show that that goodness and people helping people and people and being characters that overcame adversity and helped others to overcome adversity. Well, and what's so beautiful about the the fairy tale book, Princess April Morning Glory, is when you see it, I mean, this is not just a fairy tale book. Letitia did the entire book by hand in illuminated calligraphy and did all of the illustrations herself in watercolors with silver and gold leaf, with embedding little crystals. I mean, this, it is a true, when you look at the original, at the original manuscript pages that I was lucky enough to see when you showed them to me in August, they are just, they're breathtaking, breathtaking. And it's easy to understand why, despite the best efforts of Letitia and her father, they weren't able to get the book published back in 1941. No, there just wasn't a technical capabilities then to to reproduce something uh, that was both that rich in watercolor and yeah. metallic uh, gilt, mm-hmm. gold and silver gilt. Uh, but thankfully now with Photoshop and the advance of time, uh, we were able to digitally restore the pages. Um, the other thing that that Letitia did that is a classic Fairbanks trait uh, that, um, again, I don't think people necessarily know that in the uh, in those early silent film years, this kind of care and detail was gone into any type of project. But Letitia meticulously researched how to create a ha- illuminated, hand-lettered manuscript. Mm-hmm. And she did that by going to the Huntington Library there in L.A., which had acquired several medieval uh, psalters. Uh, the word is psalter, and it, it comes from psalm, and it's spelled P-S-A-L-T-E-R. And a psalter was a book that a wealthy nobleman in England or France or, or Germany perhaps would would have with their favorite psalm uh, or, or biblical story, uh, hand-lettered, because, of course, there was no printing press. We're talking about the 1200s, yes. <laughs> 1300s. And they would hand-letter it onto lambskin vellum or other substance, and then the scribes would illuminate around the letters and the words to further depict the the story that was encapsulated within the, within the, the psalm. And so uh, Letitia studied exactly how these were made, and she recreated it to a T. And I know this because I have been to the, um, uh, to the Getty Museum out there in L.A. when they were having their exhibit in, uh, in December of 2013. They had an exhibit on these medieval psalters that they borrowed oh. from the Huntington Library. And I was looking at them going, wow. This is exactly like Princess April Morning Glory. <laughs> it's printed back to front on the same piece of, of vellum or art paper, and there's bleed through, just the same way there was on the original of Princess April Morning Glory that that you saw, mm-hmm. Debbie, when I showed them to you. And it was that bleed through and that technique that literally was. 800 years old when Letitia reemployed it to create Princess April Morning Glory that made it not possible to be just stock reproduced the way books are in right. modern times. Uh, I mean, that's, that is amazing. But yeah, and even when you look at the book, 
which you painstakingly, you know, you had all the illustrations, you know, everything is up to snuff and beautiful and the illuminations and the text and all. When you look at it, even in the paperback book, it, it's exquisitely done. You can see Thank the painstaking you. detail. Yes. Well, Letitia was always um, very interested in, in the techniques used on a very fine scale that, when built up, make a, a masterpiece and, and really make a piece of fine work of art. And in this is Princess April Morning Glory is absolutely no exception. When you blow it up, uh, you blow up a, a digital scan, and you you see you can tell she used a single hair camel's hair brush mm-hmm. dipped in India ink and outlined every single letter yeah. in the old English script that she uses. And then she went back with a thicker brush, probably containing all of no more than 10 camel's hairs, and would dip that and then would fill in very carefully her outlined letters. Amazing. Such is the detail and the attention to, to, to literally one pixel wide, one hair wide stroke mm-hmm. that went into every single letter of the book. And that's not even talking about the illustrations, which are all... Well, yes, thank uh, you. Yeah, I, They are just... Her use of color and the softness of the watercolor, she finds a beautiful balance be- with softness and some vibrancy uh, with the saturation. But then you look at things like little pussy willows and the the blue butterfly and these tiny, tiny, tiny little single hair dots of ink and paint that add this beautiful visual texture. It's it's stunning. Yes, thank you. And one of the things I realized on this trip to Europe when I had a chance to go and look at countless museums and explore art from the 1200s and 1300s was I realized she even recreated in many instances the style of painting from that epoch. Mm-hmm because it is actually prior to the Renaissance and prior to the development of uh, 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 single-point or two-point perspectives Mm -hmm. that really mark the transition from a more flat, iconic style that you see in those early medieval paintings to the, the richness that we associate with Michelangelo and Leonardo and da Vinci and the other master painters that really developed a much more, almost a photographic style. Oh, yeah. I mean, she... Letitia, again, preserved every aspect of how to create a, a, an illuminated manuscript from the 1200s down to even the style of painting, which included primarily subdued, for our taste, for modern taste, much more subdued and delicate colors. Mm-hmm. But, you know, then she did bring in the richness, such as with, with the wise wizard, who, of course, bears a striking yes. resemblance to John Barrymore. Um, <laughs> you know, there you've got the regal purple and the red and the turquoise. But you can see she, you know, using light, using light within the brush strokes, there's a three-dimensional texture to it, such as in the oh, paintings yeah. of the artist you were referencing. I mean, it, it, it's, yeah. there's nothing two-dimensional or flat about you know, what what Letitia yeah. did w- visually with this book. No, yeah. So, you know, because we are now kicking off, you know, the holiday season this week, you know, Black Friday, the biggest shopping day of the year. How, yeah, you yeah. know, this, this book, it is a fabulous book. I mean, fabulous stocking stuffer, a fabulous gift for anyone you know, Luke Sabus and Charles Gargano were on last time you were here in studio, last time you called in, and Luke went through the whole book. And he was like, this after the show, he was saying, this is really something. I didn't know what to expect. This is amazing. And <laughs> here is a grown man who, who is mesmerized and loves this book. So, yes. So, where can. So, the best place to. Yeah, the best place to get it is is Amazon. That's the easiest and most direct. 
Um, and uh, you just go to Amazon and enter Princess April Morning Glory, and it will pop up, and it's available both in a print edition and in a Kindle edition for those who are crazy about Kindle and love it. it, it, uh, it, it we were able to preserve the illuminations, and they appear as illustrations amongst the text. Oh, the on Kindle the Kindle. Uh, well, that may be all well and good, but for my money, it's... Yes, get, you get, need the real You need paper the book. Copy. You need the paper. Because, yeah. and having seen the original manuscripts, you know, what you've done, it's like where there are blanks in the original manuscripts, you know, you have kept those blank within the book. Um, this truly is an incredible you know, reproduction. For all intents well, and purposes, it, this is... Again, we wanted to preserve those original techniques that have been lost, such as preserving blank pages on the back of full-plate illustrations, mm -hmm. because you never put anything on the back of a full-plate illustration. And there it are... always a blank page. And these full-plate illustrations are absolutely breathtaking. They are beautiful. Um, you know, the, the ones of... You know, the evil misery and the, the, the prince. And, oh, well, let's see. I have one second. Pam, I just had to let her know that our other guests are calling in. She was so intent listening oh, to you. We've got to allow room for everybody on this. Oh, you know. I can't uh, wait to hear your next guest. They, they sound fascinating. Uh, talk about Attack of the Killer Donuts? Yes, I want to hear about this. <laughs> I had no idea donuts could attack and kill. Wait, you, <laughs> but I'm not surprised. They're, they can be sneaky. <laughs> oh, trust me. It's amazing. It is. I mean, it, it's great. But, you know, before I let you go for Scott and Raphael to come on, you know, yeah. so we've got, they can get it through Amazon. Now, mm -hmm. when, when, when can we expect the Fourth Musketeer to be reissued? Well, that's a good question. We're, we're working on it right now, and it will definitely be on or bef slightly before the 100th anniversary of United Artists. So expect it to come up sometime at the end of 2018 or at the latest early 2019. Uh. Uh, but we're just securing the final permissions to include some of these photographs and uh, some of the other paperwork and things. Oh, my God. Well, I can't. You know I can't wait. I'll be the first one in line to pre-order it. <laughs> great, great. I love that. Uh, Kelly, as always, an absolute joy to talk to you again. You know. Oh, thank you so much, Debbie. It's just fabulous to talk to you. And I can't wait to get out there in a couple of weeks. I know. And spend time with you in person because I'll be out in L.A. for the first four months of the year, December and the first four months. Well, you so. know, we'll have to have you back on the show again, talk more about Fairbanks and classic film and, uh, you know, and of, and of course, you know, Luke, who's getting into virtual reality, you know, we popped that out last time about, yeah. you know, doing, you know, an animated something with Princess April. Right. So, oh, and it I'm, kind of, I'm open to that. It piqued his curiosity. So, mm -hmm. you know, we might have to, we might have to, uh, you know, drag Luke out and. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm I'm going to get my cousin Dominic over from London before oh, it's all over, of course. So he'll he'll be coming out. So maybe we can come on your show together. That would be a lot oh, of fun. I think that would be absolutely fabulous because he remembers spending time with Douglas Jr. as as a as a young boy and a young adult, and has a lot of great stories about his his grandfather. Well, that you... I, I, everybody will love. You know that Dominic is more than welcome. If you're both in town, no, you can. You. Hey, if you're both in town, you can come down to the studio and just have the two of you for the whole hour live in studio. Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> well, well, we'll see what we can work out. You and I will make it happen. There you go. I like your can-do attitude. <laughs> Douglas would have liked it too. Aww. Well, thank you, Kelly, so much. Always a joy, and I will talk to you soon. Okay, thank you, Debbie. Thanks. Bye-bye. And that was Kelly Smoot-Garrett. Again, Princess April Morning Glory. It is the most enchanting book. Get it, get it, get it. 
And all you classic film ha- fans, stay tuned. 100th anniversary of UA coming up. Dominic Fairbanks. Uh, and trust me, Kelly and I will put our heads together and get her and Dominic live in studio on the show for all you classic film fans out there. But right now, we're bringing on... Okay, the gentleman I have been waiting to talk to since I watched this film the other week, Scott Wheeler, Rafael Diaz Wagner, Attack of the Killer Donuts. This is too delicious for words, guys. <laughs> Hi. Hello. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> I didn't know what to expect when I saw this. All I knew when I saw the title was I have to see this movie. Good. You know, <laughs> that, that's the reaction we wanted. You know, we've had Attack of the Killer Tomatoes, Attack of the 50-Foot Woman, Attack of This, Attack of That, but we've never had Killer Donuts. Never mm-hmm. pastry. <laughs> I, I, this is, you know, and Raphael, you're also one of the one of the co-writers on this. You're producer and co-writer. Correct. Mm-hmm. And you, Scott, you know, you direct this all by your little lonesome. With, with and uh, and and the visual effects side too, we did that with uh, uh, the two guys that I work with, uh, Chris McIntyre and Kevin Lane. I was going to say because with your uh, visual effects background, um, I mean, it, this had to be a dream come true for you to just like play in a sandbox or a donut box, however you want to look at it. It was a, <laughs> it was a lot of fun, and and. Kevin, who did a lot of the donut animations, has a very twisted uh, sense of humor, so it worked out perfect. Well, it definitely it, it definitely shows a twisted sense of humor, even from a story level. Raphael, I mean, where did you, where did you and your co-writers Nathan and Chris, where did you come up with the idea of killer donuts with a science spin to it? And then for you, Scott, how did this fall into your lap? And don't even tell me it was while you were at Winchell's or someplace or, or Dunkin' Donuts having do- <laughs> coffee and donuts. I was uh, I was shooting I, a movie in um, in Florida called um, Shark and Saw Women's Prison Massacre, and then um, Krista Christopher was on that movie as well. And we were talking, and he was saying, "Oh, I have this this idea for Killer Donuts," and I thought it was great once I heard it. And then uh, I acquired the script, and then I we we went through a couple of drafts, and I, I rewrote it and. and added more of the professor and the rat and changed it to attack of the killer donuts. And then the rest is, is history. <laughs> oh, so you didn't have that much to do with it, you know, but <laughs> <laughs> you know, what is it, what, what is it about donuts that spoke to you, Raphael, when you, when you, this idea from Chris and the script came to you? What, what I like was that I, um, I'm not a horror fan per se, but I like that this was horror comedy and that they don't really make just goofy, fun movies anymore. And I thought that's what it was. It was, you know, it was that kind of movie. And it got a, you know, gave us a chance to really play. Mm-hmm. And we used uh, real donuts, puppet donuts, and then uh, over 100 shots of CGI donuts. Oh, my God. Well, I think there <laughs> were some bagels tossed in there, too, because a couple of those donuts really look like bagels. They were big, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know. Well, they're mutated, so. No, they're mutated. <laughs> You yeah. know, and they all have teeth. Muscular donuts. You know, it's it's very yeah. interesting in muscular donuts. Yeah, <laughs> all the muscles there because when anybody tries to eat these donuts, you're going to lose all the muscle you have on your body. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah. Scott, how did you get involved in this? I got involved originally uh, to do the visual effects side of, of things, and Raphael, you know, had worked with a bunch of people that that I'd worked with before, so. We got put in touch with each other, um, and then we took on the post-production as well, uh, doing the editorial and 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 everything. So it's kind of a, I mean, the, the kind of low-budget horror and comedy and whatever uh, team is. A, it's a very small group of people, and everybody kind of knows each other. So, um, you know, Raphael and I had been kind of circling around doing movies with the same kind of people, and then we kind of came together on this one. Well, something that I've, because of your visual effects background, for you as a director, did you sit down, because I love your cinematographer. I love Howard Wexler's work. I have, I've been watching his films for years. You know, Coffee Date, True Loved, and of course, he just did Friends F and Friends F and Friends for Quincy Rose. Um, 
did you actually, with your visual effects knowledge, did you storyboard this out? Did you shot list this? How did you approach creating your visual design? Because this is a very visually reliant film. I mean, mostly you just, uh, you know, read through it. Not, not a lot of storyboarding goes on in low-budget movies as much as it probably should, uh, mm-hmm. just because there's the time and money to do that kind of thing. But uh, mostly you just read through the script and you get a feeling for, for what it is. And I can see it in my head uh, after reading it, and I know what, you know, what the shot count is going to be, basically, from just doing a pass through a script. So just because I've been doing it for a while. Now, did you do any of the any of the killer donut effects? Did you do any in camera, or did you just save them all and do them afterwards, in post? No, there were a bunch of practical like explosions, exploding donuts, and there was a bunch of you know handfuls of donuts. Everybody throwing donuts from behind the camera at people, and so there's it's a mixture of both. So obviously, to Scott's credit, well, I originally I'm not a big fan of CGI, and I had told him, you know, I really want to use puppets because I want that feel. And he was like, "Look, I understand you want puppets and stuff like that, but let me tell you, you can write donut rolls off a table, but when you're on the twentieth take and it's not rolling right, you'll remember I said that." And in the end, he was right, and we did. You know, I wish we had more effect shots that he had done because it was it really did come out great. Oh, I mean, the effects, I mean, and the blend, I'm sure, like, the scene out on the street during the night where, you know, with the cars and (laughs) donuts are, like, being pelted, I'm sure that was everybody behind the camera throwing most of those. Yeah, that was fun, and and we had a couple of 30-year veterans, um, Don Markell, that he was part of the team that built the replica of the White House and blew it up in the first Independence Day. Uh Uh-huh. He was on there, and he told me he hadn't had this much fun ever on a movie set (laughs) so Uh, well (laughs) it was fun you know this begs the the two important questions number one what was the donut budget on the film and number two were donuts part of your craft services well (laughs) funny you should ask we had we had to go to around la and get stale donuts because if you use fresh donuts are too soft yeah so we got a bunch of donuts and we put them on a table and of course we didn't put a sign. So I turned around and I came back in half an hour and everybody's attacking the donuts and it's like, "No, those are props. That's not craft <laughs> services." So we had to, <laughs> we had to put up a sign and hide the donuts. Uh well, did you go get real donuts for craft services to make everyone happy? <laughs> we had a little bit of both. <laughs> we had Krispy yeah. Kreme for the for craft services. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. But after being pelted by donuts and throwing donut pieces and everything, I don't think anybody really wanted to have donuts after a while. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I mean, what what kind what went into this for you, Scott? You've got you have a few other uh, you know feature directorials under your belt, um, but then you're working with Robert Hummel on the production design. You've got Howard there as your cinematographer, and you're also doing casting here. And I have to say, you really struck gold with Justin Ray, Kayla Compton, and Ben Heyman. Ben Heyman. As geeky Howard, he is, he just, he's a standout. What, what was yeah, this? No, he, ca- he was fantastic. And Kaylee was fantastic to him. And they were, everybody was really good. He just kind of hit the right mark for everything. Yeah, because that chemistry there, especially between the characters of Johnny and Michelle, that's very important to how this is going to play out in terms of the mystery behind the Killer Donuts. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's nice that they're playing it somewhat straight and everybody else is just being a little bit, like Pete Tommy is being very goofy about it, very over the top, and that all blends in and makes it funny. Uh, but them kind of being the straight people stuck in this whole thing is is amusing. This is probably one of the first scripts that I've read in a long time that actually just had me laughing out loud reading it, so it was, you know, it was and, a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun to see it come together, too. And, of course, you get see Thomas Howell involved uh, as Officer Roberts, and he yeah. just, he went for broke here. That was yeah. no holds barred in his performance. Yeah, which was fantastic. I think he's hilarious. Yeah, how do you... He was a really good sport about it, too. I mean, I remember him on the first day on the set. He's like, let's see, I started my career as a kid. I was Spielberg. Then I did The Outsiders. Now I'm in Killer Donuts. Yep, my career is doing great. <laughs> <laughs> so he was really, he was always joking about... <laughs> Yeah, you know, did you did you think you'd get somebody with the legacy of C. Thomas Howell to come on board with the film? 
N- no, I mean we we, we I I always like to just go for broke. There's nothing you, you know. What's the worst that can happen is he says no. So I was like, oh, so somebody knew him and we got his whole phone number and we got a hold of him and he said yeah. You know the, the calendar was right, and he happened to shoot it. And as a matter of fact, when we went to the Rome Film Festival, we brought him along too, and it was great. And they loved him. He was like the the town celebrity. So. Well, you know, all these vintage actors, you know, the the people that we have watched come up through the 80s, the 90s, you know, some even a little bit earlier from the 70s. You know, now, you know, they're all having resurgences with a lot of the European crowds. And I think a lot of it is due to, you know, streaming, you know, Netflix, Hulu, Amazon, uh, your DVD and Blu-ray. Definitely. Everybody's got a life beyond what uh, Hollywood dictates. Definitely. And with with DVD and Blu-ray that so many people are saying, oh, they're de- it's dead. But when it comes to cult films and classic films, there's a lot of specialty houses that are putting those kind of DVDs out there, and that's what's bringing this back. Well, and, you know... And actors like them. And I'm glad you mentioned that, Raphael, because I, I take a look at, at the films you guys have done, and Scott, you know, you, you direct, you know, Martian Land, Avalanche Sharks... You know, we, uh, you know, with Sharknado out there, the whole Sharknado 5, I guess they're going to do a Sharknado 6. All of this stuff, yeah. Sinbad and the War of the Furies, you know, these are, th- is this something that you consider when you're looking at a project? Is the quote unquote possible camp factor or cult factor that's going to play in? Yeah, I mean, I like, I, I definitely like movies that don't take themselves seriously. So it's, and and a lot of the times, you know, you can't because you don't have the money to really take it seriously. Um, so it's just fun to have, you know, fun with it and let let people know that you know it's silly and uh, just enjoy it. Because we're not, you know, we're not making war and peace. We're making it back to the killer donut. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I was quoted in one of the interviews saying that this is uh, it's definitely the Citizen Kane of pa- pastry uh, disaster movies. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is it's not the it's not the Titanic of disaster no, movies. No, no, <laughs> no. You know, I could I could really see this. You know, Joan Crawford and her Mildred Pierce. You know, with and all of her baking. I can just imagine if you had a Joan Crawford character in here. Uh, <laughs> the Joan you know, Crawford donut. Uh, yes, you know that that would be some truly something. You know, um, for you, Scott, I'm really curious um, because early in your career, you were VFX supervisor, uh, supervising animator on one of everyone's favorite shows, Buffy the Vampire Slayer. You know, working on a show like that, that, you know, here again, I mean, it attained cult status. One of the big cult films. You also worked on X-Files doing, you know, the animation what is it about those early shows that you consistently worked on that just sent your career in a VFX trajectory? Um, I mean, I guess, I don't know, working in episodic is certainly, uh, the, I enjoyed episodic only because it had to air on Tuesday. So you weren't spending, you know, you weren't stuck doing, refining a shot for a year. Right doing minor changes that nobody will ever see the difference to. Um, and that that mindset in getting it as best as it possibly be within, you know, a week and a half window kind of set me up for doing the low-budget video stuff because that's, you kind of have to have that mindset. If you have much more of a feature film mindset, you're going to get one shot done of 100 shots in these kind of movies. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. I mean, I think that... Having the episodic background has helped with that mindset, at least. Do you like directing feature films? Yeah, I really enjoy it. It's, uh, it's. I kind of, you know, fell into it just because I was doing uh, all the visual effects for a company called The Asylum uh, that I've done a bunch of the movies for. Uh, and they asked me, if, you know, after I've been doing it for two years, do I want to direct one? I said, sure. <laughs> so didn't know, really know how that was going to come out. <laughs> But, you know, I'd already known my way around the set. I'd just never been the person in charge of it. So that kind of worked out well, and I enjoyed it. You know, what do you and I actually enjoy that a lot more. What do you find the most challenging aspect of directing and directing a film like Attack of the Killer Donuts? Uh, Other than no money. 
Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that can be a, that can be a challenge in itself, but it can also be if you if you want to look at it the right way, it can be very liberating mm-hmm. because you know you're not set to one way of doing something, um, and there's always a problem to be solved. So budget always creates a problem no matter what day of shooting it is. You know, you could get somewhere and the house you were supposed to shoot in isn't available and you have to make up, okay, well, where are we going to do now? Mm-hmm. Um, and I enjoy that problem-solving portion of it. Yeah, and uh, similarly for you, Raphael, what what drew you into producing and into producing these type of cult films? Well, I've done a little bit of everything. I, I produced a romantic comedy in Dominican Republic, and then I've done two of these kind of cult films, and then now I'm actually moving into the documentary world. So I, I do a little bit of everything. I just like to I make movies I, I want to watch, and I'm not a film snob. Sometimes I'll watch you know stuff from the BBC, and sometimes I'll watch Attack of the Killer Donuts, <laughs> you know. And, and I really like like Scott says, I like films that don't take themselves seriously. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I like these kind of fun cult movies that I think was was very prominent in the 80s and, and you don't really see it now. I don't I, movies are so serious. Every superhero movie is the end of the world. It's like, oh man, what a bummer. <laughs> you at, know. At least if we have yeah. the end of the world, well, let it be with Myers donuts. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> I said at least if we have the end of the world, let it be with donuts. <laughs> right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Death by sugar. <laughs> <laughs> you know, did you find, you know, did you find in working on this film, is there anything new that each of you learned about the filmmaking process that you'll take with you oh, into I, your future projects? Definitely. I, I right. think you have to surround yourself with, with uh, like-minded people. And there was a, like, you, you mentioned some of the names, you know, Howard Wexler and, and Scott has a lot of, you know, experience. It's just, there were a lot of veterans in this. I mean, like I was saying, you know, Dom was part of the team that won the Academy Award for, for Independence Day. Mm-hmm. And it was a lot of veterans that w- wanted to be on this film, even though the money w- was low. But it was, like I said, we had such a, a fun time. I mean, some of the, the stuff we shot was in Acton, California at night, mm-hmm. and it was like 40 degrees, 38 degrees. I mean, uh, um, Ky- uh, Kyla, is good. she's great. She was getting out of the car in that tank top, and it was 30 degrees. And oh I'm from Miami. God. I was bundled up like I was in the Arctic. And they never complained, and everything. Everybody was having a good old time, and we were just laughing on set so much. You know, it was just so ridiculous. And then Dom would get dressed in this like Bigfoot outfit and uh-huh. scare like the the wardrobe mistress oh, and the, and the makeup girls. It was hilarious. Whenever you heard somebody scream, it was Dom trying to scare them. Oh, it was really fun. Oh my <laughs> god! So you were shooting night. You were shooting night for night. Then you weren't doing reversals, Scott. No, it was all all the. Uh... Horrible cold night stuff, but I actually I don't get cold. So I'm, and but it's always funny to go on a set and see the actors, you know, in t-shirts and shorts, and they're supposed to be pretending like it's a warm summer day. And you look behind the camera, and everybody's in Arctic sled dog entire, uh, and it just doesn't doesn't seem fair. Yeah, um, how it, you know what? It were... always amazes me that actors can pretend they're not cold and stop shivering. Yeah, you know, that, that, and of course, we didn't see any cold breath coming out of them either when they were talking or breathing, which can be a dead giveaway. But that yeah. that wasn't the case here. Well, yeah, it, that's, if, that's I don't want to give it away. It happened. Ah. <laughs> you might not have seen it, but it, it was cold. <laughs> so we had some movie magic happening there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm, I'm very curious about what, what attracted each of you to filmmaking? No matter what the job, but what drew each of you into filmmaking that have kept you doing this? I mean, Scott, you've been doing this for decades now. And you've yeah, seen I'm old. you've seen technology <laughs> changing over the years. Uh, you know, and you stick around and you keep doing more and more. So I'm curious, what was the attraction for each of you to begin with? to enter into this I mean, I, this world? I came into it from the technology side just because my background was always computer science and computers. And, you know, of course, like every kid growing up in the 70s, I went to see Star Wars and said, that's what I want to do. Uh, and I spent a lot of time trying to figure out, because I was a computer nerd, how to make that work with the computer as well. Um, so that's kind of where I got into it. And I was programming during the day and at night coming home and, 
working on an effects reel uh, to send out to people. And, you know, around the mid-90s, I sent some stuff out to Fox, and they then got hired to work on a show called Space Above and Beyond. And then from there, I just stayed out. <laughs> Loved it so much. <laughs> and what about for you, what about for you, Raphael? What what led you into this into this business? Oh, I've I've been I've loved filming since I was a kid. I made my first movie when I was ten with a Betamax camera, and I was kind of in and out for many years. And I went to the university here and in, in Florida International University in Miami, and they didn't have a film program. And then my parents, of course, encouraged me to do something else. <laughs> my mom still thinks I'm, I'm going to be a lawyer. And I'm 44, so <laughs> she hasn't given up hope. Hope springs but eternal. somehow or another, I always just came came back to it, and that's what I really love. I mean, I, I love being on set. The worst day on set is better than the best day in an office. I just, I, it's in my blood. I love mm-hmm. it. Oh, trust me. Having worked production for a number of years, having worked in offices, I can't agree with you. I mean, that is that is <laughs> the truest statement I've ever heard. <laughs> that 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 is that is the yep. that is the absolute truth, Raphael. So now, how can everybody experience the wonderful world of the Attack of the Killer Donuts? Well, it's um, out on it's iTunes, been... Amazon, and a, a lot of other platforms. I know it's in a theater in um, in LA and Santa Fe, and we're trying to get it into a theater here in South Florida in in January. And I've gotten a request for theater in Philadelphia, so it's. This is really like it is a cult film, and we've known it since the beginning. And I think it's now is when it's really going to get momentum. And I wouldn't be surprised if there's more theatrical, even at a later date, where it really starts to where it's almost like a Rocky Horror Picture Show. Yeah, and, I, and we're in negotiations with with Showtime, I believe, for oh. February, but that hasn't been confirmed yet. Well, see, and it's funny you mentioned Rocky Horror because as I'm watching the film, I thought of Rocky Horror Picture Show. I saw it when it very first came out. And I saw it in Philadelphia at the Theater of the Living Arts uh, back in the 1970s. And as I'm watching donuts being pelted everywhere on screen, I kept thinking, oh, my God, <laughs> people will be in the theaters throwing donuts at the screen. I can see this as an audience participation film. Definitely. I definitely uh, something that I want to pursue uh, is in college campuses, especially the, the inflatable outside Kind of oh. screens, so they can do that because uh, uh, once you say that to a theater, they're gonna be like, they're going to be throwing what? <laughs> theater owners don't like that. <laughs> yeah. Well, but if you do it outside, it'll really. I think that'll really catch on. Oh, I think that's. I think that's a brilliant idea. I think, and you know, Southern California is a perfect place to do it because of the weather. Florida is a perfect place to do it, unless a hurricane is is lingering offshore. But uh, <laughs> this is a great. Yeah, actually, uh... George R.R. Uh, Martin has been showing it in his theater in Santa Fe, so it was up there the last few days. And what has the feedback been from the public that have seen it that you've spoken to? Well, when we I won our festival run, it. we we won Best Feature at Florida Supercom, which is the biggest comic book convention in, in Florida. Uh-huh. And it was great because from the word go, people were really into it, and they were yelling at the screen. Like when the kids get out of the car, so many people yelled, "Don't get out of the car!" It was it was really funny. <laughs> so that was great. They 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 love the film. They really got it. I mean, the people who come to see the movie, they get it. You know, and if you see uh, on IMDb the reviews, they they reflect that. Oh well, I think one of them says that it's like if you're reading this, you know what kind of movie this is. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, guys, I can't thank you enough for coming on behind the lens today. This has been—I've been just dying, waiting to talk to you about this film. The minute I saw it, I was emailing back to Kim, your publicist. It's like, oh my god, oh my god, I have to talk to these guys <laughs> it, because it's you—it's creative. It's inventive. It's funny. You've got horror. Um, you have some bloodletting. It could be jelly letting. Yep. We don't know. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But it, it's just one of those films that you can sit back and you can just have a good time. You can watch it with your friends. And this is the kind of movie where you want people yelling at the screen. Yes, yeah. and it's kid friendly. <laughs> it really, it, it actually is. It really is, you know, and that's something that is so important. I mean, I would have no qualms, you know, letting, you know, young teens or something, you know, not little kids, but, you know, junior high, middle, you know, older middle school, 
they get a kick out of this. Of course, don't have any donuts yeah. in the house, parents, if you let them see it, because you will probably have a mess. <laughs> well, guys, thank well, you. Well, getting, people, getting kids healthy afraid of donuts is probably not a bad thing. Well, that's true, too. <laughs> that's true, too, and it just leaves more for us adults. Yeah. <laughs> Guys, again, thank you so, so much. Everybody can see Attack of the Killer Donuts, iTunes, digital, download, see it, see it, see it, and watch for more theaters. <laughs> this has been a joy. I hope you guys will come back on the show again. Absolutely. Oh, anytime. Thank you for having us. One, that thank is you. fabulous. Again, thank you so much, guys. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. Take care. And that's all the time we have today. Getting to Disney Skeletons would have been really nice. We're going to have to hold off on Skeletons until next week. Next week, half of the show is going to be all interview clips, uh, awards consideration. And we're going to have the team here from Rusty Revolver, which is another potential cult classic movement. So until next week. I'm Debbie Elias. This is Behind the Lens.